University of Catalonia, Politecnica of Catalonia, on the quantum dipole in two dimensions. So, Thanks, yeah. Florian. Uh, oh, I, I speak a bit loud, so sorry if it's too loud. So uh, thank you to organizers for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to explain what we are doing in the last years in my group, uh, what is called uh, this Barcelona Quantum Monte Carlo group in the Technical University of Catalonia in Barcelona. Okay? This is a work made along the years with my colleagues, uh, Ferran Mazanti and Grigor, uh, Grigory Estakarczyk, and also uh, former students, Raul Bombin, Juan Sanchez, Grecia Guijarro from Mexico, and also my colleague, uh, Mari Carmen Gordillo, for a, a long time. So uh, let me try to see if it works. It worked. Up. Ah, OK. So the outline of my talk will be the following. So I will disc so my approach, which is a microscopic approach to the problem. OK, so our uh, go method is based on this quantum Monte Carlo methods, which are a initio in the sense that we start directly from the Hamiltonian of the system and we solve the many body problem in principle in an exact way. I will comment about that. I will comment about super stripes. Uh, it's, a, it's a fashion way of producing a kind of super solid using uh, tilted dipoles in two dimensions. It connects with the talk uh, before by Lorian. I think it's a lot of interesting physics to do in 2D. Uh, I will show uh, our results about this bake a phase transition that has been discussed here for a long. For a long. Uh, I will show how uh, is our perspective as people who, doing uh, microscopic simulations about this bake -AT transition, how we get this. Then I will uh, discuss a, fun, a funny system, which is bilayer system. So imagine that I have two layers of dipoles and there is a lot of uh, funny things to, that emerge with this uh, dipolar setup, I will try to show you. In particular, I will show that you can have, uh, you can have an ultra dilute liquid with dipoles playing with this uh, uh, bilayer geometry. It's, uh, I think it's a very interesting result. Uh, hopefully someone, an experimentalist can check if this is work or not. <laughs> this is a theoretical prediction up to now. And as I will comment also, I will show you that even you can get solid phases, which is even more strange uh, using dipoles in a multi-layer geometry. If I have time, I also will comment about all the stuff, all the stuff in the sense that is helium, but helium on graphite is a very rich system. And I will show you that uh, even in that case, which is a two-dimensional system, we see some uh, super solidity in the system. So uh, first, some words about the methods. Uh, Diffusion Monte Carlo was introduced by Silvio, so I will not carry a lot of time with this. So the idea is that we start with the Schrodinger equation. H is the Hamiltonian. E is a, is a constant for the problem. And then uh, look at here. This is written in imaginary time because we are searching for the ground state. And then uh, what we make is essentially we expand the wave function, which depends on the time, in the full basis of the Hamiltonian, okay, in a standard fashion. But now there is not the i here, so this is the decaying exponential term. So uh, this is our agent function. So the idea, principal idea of all the projection methods, is that when this imaginary time goes to infinity. So in this combination of terms, only the ground state survives because it's the, only, it's the one with the lowest energy. So this is a projection method. So then uh, running out this uh, at the style of Green's function, the idea is that you get the ground state of the system, of a many body system. So you are really solving the many body Schrodinger equation that you know is very hard to, to solve. So for bosons is exact within a statistical noise. For fermions, we have the same problem that Sylvie also commented, that makes that uh, the solution of this is just an upper bound. A good upper bound, but an upper bound. Mm. Yes. Diffusion, uh, well, why is it called diffusion? Because uh, when you uh, split, okay, here are more work to do. You, you write this in terms of the Green's function of the system. So you write this, the, the Schrodinger equation in, in integral form. 
and the Green's function at short time, the part that comes from the kinetic propagator is just a diffusion in imaginary time. So it's like a classical diffusion. This is the why is called diffusion Monte Carlo. So diffusion Monte Carlo is a diffusion process, and then there is a drift force that is a technical question, uh, moves the walkers. Walkers are the configuration points to the regions where are interesting are large. And then there is what is called the branching term. It's a bit technical, but the name diffusion comes from the kinetic part. Hmm? So a second approach to, to get the ground, the ground state is what is called the, this path integral ground state method. This is an alternative to the first one. The name is really ugly, uh, so big peaks is not a good, <laughs> it's okay, but <laughs> I am a bit weighted, yeah, but uh, uh, the first time that you see this is why you use this, because this is path integral ground state. Some people call it variational path integral, okay, but it's the same method. Well, the idea is again a projective method. So the idea is that you use the propagator in the imaginary time, but then a difference with the, with the previous uh, approach, what you make is just you put a boundary condition and you propagate the survey wave function using the Green's propagator here, but just for a short time, okay? So then the, the final wave function comes from uh, this kind of movement here, okay? This kind of uh, bit or polymer, if you want, that you move along the space. So every one of these polymers represents a particle. Okay, and this polymer moves along the time and interacts with other polymers, which represent other particles. I, I will comment now the version at, at finite temperature, which is even, even better to show this behavior. This is Feynman ideas, in fact, okay, but uh, translated to the codes. So the idea is that this method is uh, sometimes more flexible than diffusion Monte Carlo, and the influence of the trial function that you need to put here in the extremes is just very small. So just you need to ensure that the wave function, for instance, if you are uh, computing bosons, this trial wave function has to be symmetric under the interchange, and that's all. And the method works perfectly well. And also technically, because this method allows for a, a good calculation of the one body density matrix, which is a real important quantity, to, uh, to know the coherence of a system. In the case of diffusion Monte Carlo, technically it's not perfect. So we have a bit of bias, but in that case it's exact, okay? But then if you go to, to find a temperature, because we want to study this uh, Bake difference transition, we need an algorithm that is able to move the system to, to calculate the properties of the system at finite temperature. Mm -hmm. And this is what is called the finite temperature path integral Monte Carlo. Again, now it's not written in terms of the wave function, you know, because you are at now at finite temperature. So the language now is the thermal density matrix, which is, as you know, the exponential of the Hamiltonian, where beta is the inverse of the temperature. Okay. Then uh, if you are able to access to this uh, basis, every expectation value, you know from a statistical mechanics that they can be solved in this way. Okay, well, Z is the partition function. If you project in the coordinate space this equation, okay, you can get this expression here in which it appears this term, which is the uh, spatial representation of the density matrix. So written in the basis of the Hamiltonian. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that you need to calculate this density matrix or to have an estimation of the density matrix and then to sample any operator through this relation. The, the the good thing about the density matrix is that, as probably you remember from quantum mechanics, it can always be de decomposed in the following way. So it follows a convolution property. So in such a way that at a given temperature, beta is the inverse of the temperature, you can uh, make the convolution product of two density matrices, but at higher temperature, at two times in that case temperature, okay? So if you are able to approximate, which is the, uh, the, the thermal density matrix at high temperature, and you iterate this not two, but many times, you can arrive to the, the, the temperature that you want. This is the essential idea. Huh? So we need to apply this convolution property. 
and to get a good approximation for the density matrix at high t. And then just iterate, hmm? as you know here, is written in this equation. Okay, this is for m terms, here is for two, but the idea is the same. Hmm? So then this problem, you know, when, once you write the, 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 the thermal density matrix using this language, what you see is that the problem it is known from all times, maps to a problem of interacting polymers, if you want, huh? where uh, each polymer, every pom polymer is closed because the partition function imposes that is a circular. So you have to close by periodicity to the initial point. So this, each one of these kind of polymers is a particle. Okay, it's a presentation of a particle. So here I have a particle, here I have a second particle. What couples these terms, which are called bits in the technical language, bits, okay, are coupled to by an harmonic uh, coupling here that comes from the kinetic propagator. And uh, every representation of the particle, every bit interacts with the same bit of the same number through the potential. Okay, so then I have the coupling between the effect of the kinetic action and the interaction part between bits of the same size. Okay, so this is the essential idea. So in principle, you map the problem to a classical problem where particles are polymers that interact in this form. Hmm? Well, here is explained. So this is the interaction between bits and then you have interaction between different. Of course, uh, this is... Uh, technically quite involved okay so the, here it seems easy but then in the practice it's quite involved because uh, uh, first uh, using the first approximation which is called the primitive action uh, it's impossible to go to superfluids because the number of terms that you need here the number of bits is incredibly large so the system becomes blocked so it is a problem of slowing down so the system is not evolving if you have, of you know about Monte Carlo, this is the problem that sometimes it becomes blocked because uh, you cannot sample all the configuration space. So to improve that, you need to work a bit more on this uh, the coupling of the Green's function in terms of the kinetic and, and potential part. The first term is the if you remain re remain if you remember this uh, baker humble hausdorff formula. Okay, so the first term is to the couple kinetic and potential, but then it appears the next terms, which contains commutators, three commutators, and so on and so forth. Okay, so you can include more terms and in such a way that these strings are a bit more complicated, not just this one, but then the number, the number of bits that you need are smaller. Okay, so in this sense, you can go to superfluids. This is one thing. The second thing and more involved is that in the case of bosons, I need to ensure that the partition function has to be symmetric under the interchange. Okay, so I have to sum uh, over all the permutations here in order to be symmetric. Okay, so we need to sample not only the space configuration, but the permutation configuration. Hmm? And this is uh, rather involved, uh, but in the last days, in the last times, we use a proposal which is called warm algorithm, it becomes very famous in our field, in which the sampling of the permutation is becoming much more efficient. But at the beginning was difficult to sample that. Now it is sampled in an efficient way. So I think that with that, we can go to the results that we have obtained in the last years. The first uh, thing is, let me... Uh, right here, the Hamiltonian. So we start with the Hamiltonian. So our approximation is Apinitio. They are not being filled here. So we start with a full Hamiltonian, and then we solve the many body problem in the exact way within a statistical noise. We have to pay a price that we have statistical noise, but there is not any bias apart from that if we work properly. Okay, so then is this is the Hamiltonian. The interaction we have seen uh, this morning the interaction is this strange thing here, which is uh, uh, depends on r to the n minus three and is anisotropic, as you see from these scalar products. Uh, in the case of a tidal dipole, so I will now present results on a, on a two-dimensional system, poorly two-dimensional system, 
but now the dipoles has a given angle with respect to the perpendicular direction. If alpha is zero, okay, if the, all the dipoles are perpendicular to the plane, the interaction is just uh, this one over r to the three, so is is isotropic, okay? Then the problem is easier. We solved that many years ago. It crystallizes at high density and so on. But if you just turn the, the dipoles just in a, a tilt an angle with a magnetic field, then it appears the anisotropy immediately, okay? In the sense that uh, two dipoles in this direction are repulsive, but in this direction are attractive. So we have the competition in, in two directions in the plane. These are repulsive and these are attractive, okay? So that, that produces a rich phase diagram due to the anisotropy of the system and also due to, to this quasi long range behavior of the potential. Huh? And this is what uh, emerges from, for instance, from our calculations. Here uh, from top to bottom, we have N is the density. So we have several densities and we can also change the alpha, okay? By the way, I, <clears throat> as, I, as there is not any two body potential, I have to, I, oh, sorry. There is a maximum angle uh, alpha in which the system is stable. So if I, if I tilt more and more the, the, the dipoles, the system collapses because the system becomes attractive. So this term dominates the repulsive one and the system is collapsed, okay? In order to avoid the collapse, we need to put a two-body correlation, but in this case, it's not introduced here. Okay, so uh, we see here what happens. For instance, this is the uh, static structure factor. The static structure factor, which is the Fourier transform of the pair distribution function, is uh, is a quantity which is very important to characterize order in the system. Okay, because if the static structure factor shows a say a black peak, it means that you have a crystal, for instance, okay? So uh, if you look at here, uh, this is the simulation in uh, this S of K in the X and Y direction, okay? You already see, even when the density is low, forget about this black, we see that the two uh, S of Ks are different and one has a small peak here, okay? And the other one is more smooth. This is how it appears, the simulation in our language. This is what is called a snapshot. So we plot all the bits for all the particles, and we have a representation of our system in the simulation, okay? If you increase the density from 64 to 128, keeping the same angle, we see how the, this red peak starts to grow Whereas the second, the blue, is more or less the same. What's the red and what's the blue? The red corresponds to the direction in which the system is, uh, is repulsive, okay? And the blue is the one in which are attractive, okay? So if you look at here, uh, well, it seems that something starts to happen, but it's not clear at this scale, okay? But if you increase a bit more the density or even increase, uh, increase the angle and you go close to the critical value before collapsing, you see here the formation of a black, really a black peak. Look at here the scale. The black peak means that the height of the peak is of the order of the number of particles. This is the idea of a crystal. And when I have a black peak, the peak is more or less proportional to the number of particles. So you see that here, there are two peaks Instead, this blue have some structure, but it's still not very important. But if you look at the configuration, the snapshots of the system, you see how the system, I have no perspective here, but probably you see that it appears, it starts to appear in order of system, okay? The system, it starts to appear in organized in a bands. Uh -huh. And that's the reason why looking at S of K in the transverse direction, you see order, okay? The order is clearly shown by the S of K, okay? So with the main characteristic of a crystal from a microscopic point of view is to calculate this S of K. So that can also even uh, observe it in the, uh, what is called the two body radial distribution function that shows the probability of finding two particles at a given distance. And you see that if the, when the system is 
say far from this formation of stripes, you, you see something here, but not relevant. But when you arrive to this regime, you see the formation of the clear these bands. Okay. What is produced here is a stripe phase. Yeah? This is called the stripe phase. So the system organizing bands separated by the vacuum or quasi vacuum. And then the, the, the diagram is quite rich. Uh, we determined uh, so, several years ago, how is the phase diagram of the system as a function of the density and the angle uh, of the tilt uh, phase. Okay, you have, we have three phases. Here is the collapse that I commented. So if I cross the critical value for the tilt, the system collapses to a point. So it's no more a phase. You, we need to put something more in the Hamiltonian. But what's nice is that we see we identify three phases, a gas, normal gas, with some anisotropy, but still a gas. We have a, a crystal, a triangular crystal that we can see. And more interestingly, we see, we see this, phase, this phase here, which is called the stripe phase, which is, uh, I think is very interesting to explore because I will comment that this stripe phase, in fact, in some parts is a super stripe in the sense that it's super, con super fluid. Uh, we check that the, from the gas to the stripe, this phase transition is second order, according to our results, looking at the scaling of the functions. From gas to crystal is a first order. From a stripe to solid, we don't know, because <laughs> honestly, it uh, was extremely difficult to, to calculate this line, so we are not sure about this. Huh? But it's interesting that if you look at here, uh, starting, for instance, at 340 or near 400, the system starts to be solid. But if I increase the tilt, I cross to a gas. That's curious. No? So from solid, I go to a gas. The system is not so repulsive, but then goes to a stripe. So there's a double phase transition at the fixed density, which is not so frequent. Uh, we are at zero temperature, okay? No, it's not a finite temperature. This is just due to the anisotropy of the interaction. Hmm? The problem with that for experimentalists is that the density of the stripe phase is very high. This is an, in the, what is called dipolar units. It's, it's too high, I think, to be accessible from experiments, okay? But uh, we, we also worked in, in another system, which is called the spin orbit coupled gases. In the spin orbit coupled gases, the stripe phases also appear. And uh, we show that this is also a super stripe. And there, the density is much lower. So I have seen several drawings uh, from an experimental group, confidentially, that they show that they have observed these stripes in this spin orbit systems. Probably will appear in nature or science very soon. Well, but it's, this is not enough because we can uh, try to understand if the system is or not superfluid, okay? And we have the, the tools for doing that because we can calculate in our system what is called the one body density matrix. Okay, this, you know, we have seen that before, okay? The idea is that uh, if we see a flat behavior along distance of this quantity, uh, you will have a condensate fraction, okay? So a condensate. Remember that we are at zero temperature. It's 2D, but zero temperature. 2D at zero temperature has a condensate, not quasi-condensate. It's when you put temperature that becomes a quasi-condensate. So, okay? So in 2D at zero temperature, we still have coherence. But also we can calculate the superfluidity, and that's nice. So we can calculate the superfluidity Technically, it's uh, just uh, it's, it's a strange thing. So we, we need to calculate which is the diffusion of the center of mass of the particles in our box. This is the extension to zero temperature of the winding number estimator used for a long time in the, uh, in the path integral Monte Carlo calculation. So the question is that we can access to both things and try to see if we see coherence. Here, for instance, I show what happens in the case between the one body density matrix, okay, for the stripe and for the crystal. Two interesting things. In the case of the stripe, we calculated the one body density matrix 
in the two directions, X and Y, okay? Because we were interested in, in observing if there is any effect. And the result is probably expected is that we see a kind of plateau. Of course, there is an oscillating behavior because when I move in the trans from a, from a stripe to stripe, okay, there is this sensitivity, okay, the periodicity of the stripe. But you see that the 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 asymptota is the same in, in, in the two directions. So, and this is expected, why? Because the condensate fraction is occupation of the zero momentum state and the zero momentum state is isotropic, okay? So if there is a condensate fraction, it is, doesn't matter in which direction I calculate this. Yes. These are the density that you have, the density and the, and the tilting angle of your system. So the frequency of the tilts of, of the stripes is related to the total density of the system. And also the angle, because the angle is a, a balance between attractive and repulsive terms. Okay, So it's, it's a problem with two variables, the tilting angle and the, the total density. And if you look at the crystal, so the, the solid, and you make the same calculation, you see, as expected, an exponential tail. So there is not order in a crystal. Okay, so in the, this is consistent with the idea that the stripes are in reality, in some part at least, super stripes. Let me say super stripes or super solids. It depends on the on the people. Okay, it's in the sense why I could say super solid because I have the two ingredients from a microscopic point of view. For me, a super solid is a, is a, is a solid in the sense that you have diagonal order. This is not completely true in stripes because in the stripes, along the stripe, you don't have this. So there is a one direction in which you don't feel this, but along the other directions, you have spatial order that extends to infinity. This is one property. And the second property is that you have or superfluid density or of diagonal long range order. So if you fill up these two quantities, then for me, this is a super, super solid. Huh? I prefer to sell here super stripe because, well, it's a question of terminology. Eh? Uh, well, the other thing that we uh, we made is to calculate the superfluid fraction, trying to see if the system is really superfluid or not, or when it is superfluid or not. Okay, so here is a, a plot. It's a bit difficult to see, but here is the total superfluidity of the system. This is density is high. And here I have the superfluidity across the stripes, which is the interesting one, because along the stripe is always superfluid. But the, the, the question is if the stripes are coherent along the direction transverse to the stripes. Okay, and we see that uh, the density, the superfluid density is, uh, well, is a small, but is not zero, and then goes to zero. Okay, so it depending on the density, if the density is too large, I lose the signal. But there is a window uh, close to the phase transition where I see superfluidity. This is also the same for another angle. And how we see superfluidity in our snapshots, this is very nice because uh, we see superfluidity when the chains starts to be connected for long paths, okay? When the system is not superfluid, I see one particle, another particle, and they are not interchanges, are not connected, okay? When the system is superfluid, these particles interconnect and finally arrive to a big polymer containing many particles. When you arrive to that and the polymer is of the size of the box, you see superfluidity, okay? So this is the language that we use in path integral. So this is a symptom here that you accept permutations and the system is no more uh, isolating system. We have studied what happens with this transition because we have the transition from superfluid to normal. Okay, so the idea what you get is then uh, it, as a function of the temperature. In the case of the stripes, at a given temperature, I have the super stripe. Then at a given temperature, which we call T beta T, the system becomes normal stripe. So the order resists the critical temperature, and then finally arrives to a gas. You lose the structure of the stripes when you increase the temperature just by this order. In the case of the gas, there is only one, one, one transition. The gas is always a gas. 
and there's this transition BKT. Here you show, I show how the system appears, this picture of the snapshots, I think is quite visual, when you increase the temperature. So you are going from A, B, C, D, increasing the temperature. You see that at low temperature, the stripes are very wide, well-defined, but they are connected. You see paths that connect the, the different stripes, you see? Sometimes here is one, here is another one. When this happens, it means that you are in a super regime. If you increase a bit more the temperature, you look at here, these interchanges practically disappear. There is a still one here, but the, the uh, stripes become isolated. Mm -hmm. If you increase even more, the, the stripe starts to be destroyed, and finally you arrive to a gas. Mm -hmm. So the, the evolution is here is observed in days of K, as I commented you. So when you are in the ordered system, you have a enormous peak, this is the Bragg peak, but then when you increase the temperature and you arrive to the highest temperature, this yellow, the Bragg peak has disappeared. You have a gas. So some people thought that uh, the, in, the, in the transition temperature, the, the stripe becomes a gas, this is not correct. So the stripe has a transition keeping the stripe character from the superfluid to normal. So uh, technically, how is it is made? So because we have been discussing about BKT here, no? How in our numerical studies show that there is a BKT transition? We have two things to do. Of course, first, our system has a finite number of particles. You cannot make 10,000, okay? It's impossible. <laughs> so the idea is the following. So I, I when uh, it calculates which is the superfluid fraction, okay, as a function of, uh, as a function of, of you fix the number of particles and then you see which is the superfluid, uh, how is the evolution of the superfluid density when you move the temperature, okay? So you calculate at every temperature, which is the superfluid density for a given number of particles. And yet, then you repeat for another number, another number up to your, what you can do, which is not much. <laughs> Then you plot here what is called the universal jump. The universal jump, if the Beckett works, is this relation that says that the superfluid fraction is, uh, is, uh, depends on the temperature divided by the density by exactly this, this, this low. As you see here, I, we have temperature divided by a density. So this is a line, okay? The line with this slope given by here, okay? So then what you do is to calculate which is the crossing points between our calculation and the, the universal jump. That would be the estimation of the critical temperature for this number of particles. Then you translate that in this other figure. So you plot for, I say for a given angle, for instance, alpha equals zero, you plot these intersections, okay, in this scale, because the, it is known that the scaling, scaling law for the BKT has to be this one from theory, okay? So then if it is, if it, if our, if our theory works and we plot the, the temperature as a function of this inverse of log square, and we see a linear behavior, it means that we have a BKT. This is our language. Okay? If it is not a BKT, we will not, you will not see a line in this plot. Okay, because the scaling law is, would be another one. This is uh, what is called finite size scaling in technical language, okay? And what we see is that, uh, look at here, so the intersection here is the estimation of the critical temperature in the infinite limit. Uh, what you see is that when you increase the angle, okay, the critical temperature uh, increases. Huh? So this is our prediction. So if the system is just isotropic, is this the critical temperature? But when you increase alpha at a given density, the uh, the critical temperature slightly increases. Okay. It seems that the system is more robust against fluctuations when I put this alpha. In the case of stripes, well, uh, I make the same. So the same criteria, the same thing, and I see, as you say that even in the case of stripes, I see the same scaling, exactly linear with this, okay? So that for us, this is a guarantee 
that what we have been observing is a Becker difference transition in all cases. Uh, and here you see that from a stripe to a gas, the stripe here is uh, this uh, prediction, and this is the gas. In that case, the critical temperature of the, of the stripe is reduced, so it's not so robust. So depending on the cases. Yeah, well, I have to go fast. Another thing that we have made, that we have studied extensively, is the case of the bilayer. Okay, the case of the bilayer is uh, geometrically is quite simple. I take so two layers separated by a distance h, without tunneling, without tunneling. I put uh, a dipolar gas here, a dipolar gas here. Okay, uh, in that case, all the dipoles are perpendicular to the plane. So in that case, the interaction is fully repulsive at one over L to the three. So in every plane, I have just an isotropic interaction. But if you go, uh, as you have particles here and here, you can write the Hamiltonian now in this form. So you have particles up, particles down. This is the kinetic operator for both. I have the interaction uh, intraspecies up and down, up, up with that and down, down. And then interestingly, I have this up, down, okay? If you calculate which is the interaction between a dipole here and a dipole here, this is a geometrical problem, very simple, because H is fixed. And then as H is fixed, if you arrive to this expression, that as you see, if you fix H, this is exactly a two-dimensional problem again, because the only dependence is on the radial distance in some way. So uh, interestingly, uh, uh, re very recently, it seems that it could be possible because what happens with our bilayer is that our distances has to be smaller than probably what can be made in the experiment. Okay, so we need two layers which are extremely close. But now uh, it appears this work uh, by Ketterle's group using this, this prosium, in which they claim that uh, they are, are able to achieve a sub 50 nanometers. I don't know if this is a lot or not. <laughs> I am theoretician, but they are able to get this kind of bilayers you see here. Okay, so uh, somehow uh, Lorian can help <laughs> to me with this, but uh, it, this could be promising uh, to get this uh, bilayer in action in the experiments. So about the potential, let me show, this is the up and down, uh, the, the interaction between the down and up particles. Interestingly, you see, uh, looking at the colors, that there is a, a cause of attraction. So the particles that are close in the same transverse direction, up and down are attractive, and that's important, okay? So there is an attraction between this, and there is a cause of attraction and then becomes repulsive. Okay, so that's interesting because then it appears that the system is not fully repulsive, but there is an attraction between up and down. And this is the rich system that we need. Huh? This is the, the scattering lens that you know that we can calculate both. This is a very technical. Well, the discussion is was quite all. The first one is that this potential up down is a bit singular because you know, in 2D, it is known that if the integral of the potential is smaller than zero, you have always a bound state. This is from scattering theory, let me say. But what happens is that if you make this integral for the up-down potential, this is a strictly zero. <laughs> okay, so you, you take this uh, before potential, this one uh, here. Okay, you put this potential, you introduce that in the integral and you will see that this is zero. So you are in the limiting case. So in the past, uh, there were several papers arguing that there were not any bound state in the system between up and down. Okay, what we have proved, this is not true. So there is always a bound state. Of course, um, depending on the separation, this could be exponentially small. But if the separation is not large, we have a bound state. And even more controversial was the fact that it could be trimers, tetramers, et cetera, in the system. Well, this is a bit more technical. So to do the calculation, in this case, is DMC, Diffusion Monte Carlo. We need a trial wave function. We construct this as a product of just row terms. I will probably skip that. This is a very te technical issue. We need to, to, to start our simulation with a given model. Uh, we consider equal number of dipoles in, the, in each case. And what we see, 
here is a lot of information, but what's interesting to see is that when I put uh, trimers, tetramers, pentamers, hexamers, the binding energy is increasing. So first, the trimers are bound, can be bound. This is the first message, but also tetramers can be bound, pentamers, hexamers, and so on. So the system shows, uh, here is a more detailed plot, that the energy is, the, the, the bounding energy is increasing, okay? That was at the beginning for us a surprise because we were not expecting that, okay? But if you have a many body system in which the bounding energy, the total is increasing, it means that it could exist a many body bound state. And a many body bound state is a liquid, a cell bound system, okay? That was an initial point that uh, motivated our work. Uh, by the way, we also studied a funny, funny situation is that this uh, up and down dipoles is a good representation of a hollow state. I don't know if you are familiar with hollow states. Hollow state is a, is a bound state in which the particles are extremely far. So it's, okay, so it's uh, in nuclear physics is a very important issue. So we, we checked that this, uh, our system is an example of uh, hollow states with, but, but not with two or three, which more or less are known, but even with pentamers and hexamers. This is very strange. There are not practically any case in nature where the hollow state keeps there when the number of particles grows at least up to six, like here. That was a real surprise for us. Well, this is the way in which the, the, the hollow states are, are found. So you plot the energy and here the size. So there is a scaling law. And it is, if these curves are above two, which is this limit here, it is assumed that they are hollow states. In all cases, you, you can see that they are hollow states. Well, uh, more th interesting things that appear in the bilayer is that uh, there are not only, uh, depending on the interdistance, you have not only an atomic phase, but also you have a dimeric phase. So the, the, could, there is a phase in which I have if, you have, if you want a molecular state, so up and down form a dimer, okay? And then I have a gas of dimers, okay? Because they bound. So I have a molecular state. So we studied that in the past and we observed that uh, uh, the transition from the atomic to the pair, okay? And then we were able to calculate the, the condensate fraction of pairs. Uh, the condensate fraction of pairs is not estimated with the one body density matrix, but you need to calculate the two body density matrix. It's a bit more involved, but we were able to calculate that in, in the past. But I think, yeah, I don't know. Uh, the la our last study on this, was trying to see if really the system is a liquid or could be a liquid or not, okay? So I have a bilayer and I increase the, the density of every bilayer. So the number of particles up and down is the same. And then I calculate the energy minus the energy of the dimer because I have dimers, okay? So I have to subtract that. And uh, I look at what emerges. What emerges is the following. For instance, if H is equal one in these reduced units, I see what, uh, that the energy grows more or less linearly with the density. When this happens, this is a symptom of a gas phase, okay? So in the gas phase, the density always grows with the density. But if we uh, move age, curiously increasing a bit, we start to see this, this figure, okay? So it seems to be, this is still a gas. It It is pointing to like a, gas solid transition, but finally we were not able to find this. But if you arrive to this value, you see clearly that the energy shows a minimum, okay? When the energy shows a minimum at negative values, this is the key ingredient to say that you have a cell bound system. So the system at equilibrium at zero pressure will be a liquid at this density, which as you see, extremely small. Again, this is a very, 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 very dilute liquid. Yeah? So uh, here are more cases uh, where I ch we change the different values of H. And you see in all cases, okay, this typical behavior of the liquid. 
with an equilibrium point and then positive pressure. And what's there here? What's there? This is the spinodal point. You know, in a liquid, I have a, a, a smallest density where the system breaks. So we calculated where it is. So the, in this case, the system is no more homogeneous and breaks in drops. This is the spinodal decomposition because it's negative pressure. Remember, below, below the equilibrium density, where the minimum you have, you have negative pressures. Above, you have positive pressures. You, you can stress the system for a while at negative pressure, but finally it, it, it breaks. When it breaks, it's the spinodal point. Okay, so this is the, the negative part. So uh, this is more or less the phase diagram that we published. So we have here the formation of droplets, but then at a given density, it appears clearly liquid. Okay, so our idea is that uh, that could be an alternative to the, you know, these uh, drops in the Bosch-Bosch case by, uh, announced by Petrov, in which you have this, you know, you have two bosons with an attractive interaction between bos bosons A and B and finally form a liquid, okay? In that case, it would be interesting because all the, the, the atoms are the same. So they are just, for instance, this prosium, or I don't know, you put in a bilayer and you are able to found them any body bound state which is, exact, is exceptionally ultra dilute. It's very, very dilute. And that would be interesting to explore somehow with this uh, finding by Ketterle would be doable, I don't know. Well, this is also the condensate fraction uh, that we calculated and well, it follows more or less the same. When the density grows, it goes to zero. Uh, so it is consistent. We also, it's also consistent uh, the excitation spectrum as a function of the or the energy, sorry, as a function of polarization. So uh, if you change the the balance between A and B, okay, that's important because in, at the beginning we're equal. But if you play to change A and A and then B, such a way that the sum is the same, so you can distinguish if you have a molecular condensate, a molecular system, or an atomic system. The difference is that when you have an atomic system, the energy as a function of this polarization is grows quadratically with the polarization. And the, the, here it appears the, the, uh, the susceptibility, okay? But a spin susceptibility. When you have a molecular condensate, as you have a bound state, so the energy grows linearly with the, with the polarization. And you can distinguish by calculating the energy. If you have a molecular gas, in a molecular gas, you have these dimers, and the energy grows linearly with the polarization. That's funny. Huh? But when you have a liquid or an atomic gas, you see this is quadratic, which is normally and what happens if you don't have dimers. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is new, still unpublished. Uh, what happens when I st instead of a bilayer, I have a multilayer? Imagine that you can manage to put uh, two, three, four, five layers, okay? With the same terminology. Well, what happens in that case is that uh, it's interesting because you can evolve from a gas to a crystal. So you, you are able to see, look at here, you see a, a kind of triangular crystal. You can identify, no? The triangular geometry, okay? So it means that uh, the atoms in the multilayers are so attractive Okay, that they they are frozen in a kind of line, and these lines form a triangular lattice. So, in fact, they are crystals. Okay, but crystals extremely uh, dilute. Okay, again, so, so we have another realization of uh, we have crystals of droplets. Okay, but in that case, will be uh, crystals of arrays of dipolar atoms. Okay, that's interesting. And uh, we are we are writing now this this paper for we have evolutions from a gas to a crystal, and it's interesting also that we have found that uh, um, an, a new a new uh, phase in which this uh, I don't know how we call this. So instead of having the line, so the line could bend. Okay, so they they, uh, they want to be in the line, but the, the they fluctuate quite a lot. So, and then you are not able, you see that the system is not a gas. This is a classical gas. You see some order, but not a crystalline order. It's like there is some bending of these structures, okay? 
So uh, this is a bit difficult to find. This is gas of change. We have called gas of change. Would be interesting to know if it could be observed in experiments. I don't know how, how much time I have. One minute, whoa, for sure. Uh, well, just uh, quick. Uh, I also worked for many years in helium. Uh, I was involved in the history of Moses Chan. And <laughs> I remember that was a big exciting about the super solid stuff in helium. For five years, we were, everyone in our field was trying to find, <laughs> but then it was, uh, was not possible to, to be confirmed by the experiment. But uh, we are continuing to explore helium. For instance, what we, I, I just comment that you take graphite and then you put helium on top and helium is, is strongly adsorbed on graphite. This is known from experiments from all. So, and then what, what happens is that you have layering transitions. So they have a first layer. This is very funny. And I put more helium and boop, at the moment it appears the second layer. You put more and then boop, third layer. So uh, the system uh, has first order layering transitions and uh, very clean. No, there is not any other system in nature showing this with, high, with the clarity that you get in helium. Well, we explore it a lot, but the, the, what we find is that in the second layer, in the second layer of helium on top of graphite, we observe that there is one of the registered phases. This is a very technical, but uh, when uh, helium atoms are located in a position commensurate with the lattice, which is essentially graphene, there are several structures, okay, geometrically possible. One of them is the 712, okay, which is very technical. And we see that uh, in that case, this is the estimator of the superfluid fraction. We observe it, not zero signal. Okay, so it means that uh, is is a is a is a crystal. Is so the particles are localized, but they show some small superfluidity. That was quite discussed, but we were happy because after a, bit, a while of our publication, so. Uh, the Kim Kim was one of the involved some Moses Moses Kim Chan Kim Chan was the, the authors of the famous paper, but Kim is still is working on this uh, super solidity in helium, and they found this part here in the second layer, exactly the second layer that we were studying, where they claim well, they they were not sure about if it is a resistant phase or not, but that they were able to see a superfluid here which is exactly at the density of the 712. So probably there are some phases in helium adsorbed on this graphite, which are super solid. By the way, this is not the super solid that we were searching for, okay? Because the super solid that we are searching for is because the system breaks the symmetry spontaneously. And this is induced by the substrate, okay? So this is not really the true super solid, the sun grail, so, okay? So, uh, but well, it's still interesting to show. Uh, well, the remarks, I think I, with this, I will conclude. So we observe this uh, 2D geometries, this very rich system in 2D, because you see, can see the formation of a stripe phases. This stripe shows superfluidity in, in this sense are uh, super solids. And uh, especially we are excited about these multi-layer geometries, if they can be made in the experiment. Uh, and I think we are promising to get these liquids and even the solids using uh, ultra-cold uh, Bose atoms. And with that, I think I arrived to my time. So, okay, so. so thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. So we have time for a few questions. So I want to ask about the BKT transition. Yes. If you have dipoles, then in the two dimension, you have an anisotropy. Yes. And this means you have two different superfluid densities. Yes. How do you take into account this fact in your numerical uh, estimate? Yeah, because uh, what we scale is the total superfluid density, okay? So we have two components of the superfluidity along the stripes and across the stripes, okay? But the system is, is this, so we, we compute the total superfluid density. What we scaled with the BKT was the total superfluid density, okay? 
uh, it changes. Uh, it, it changes of size, but the scenario, so the scaling that we observe, the scaling is the same that the vicuity. So if you look at, for instance... Uh, I mean the straight line you have plotted, right? That was a standard straight line without this uh, anisotropy. Uh, let me show uh, here, for instance, you have both a gas and a stripe here, okay? And both cases, we scale the total superfluid density. And in both cases, we see a linear dependence. Because here was a debate about if the superfluidity would be one dimensional, okay? So if, if, if the system would be a transition one dimensional because the stripes are like a one dimensional systems. But if you try to scale your results with one dimensional scaling, it doesn't work. So we tried and the paper is discussed. So the 1D does not reproduce the data. So that is not scaling. So here you see linear behavior. Linear behavior with this scale, it means VKT in our language. Yeah. Uh, about the stripes, I noticed yeah. that your Hamiltonian only has the dipole interaction. There's yes. no S wave uh, part. No. Like a contact. Yes. If you were to put a repulsive contact, that would help with the collapse. Yes. I guess. Uh, you are, would, you that, are. would that spoil your stripes? No, I don't think so. No. What happens, and in fact, uh, we have some results not published that we have put this uh, short range part, mm -hmm. and you see that the stripes keep there. Of course, are even more stable because I can cross, <laughs> mm -hmm. I can cross the line, and then I see. Uh, even uh, uh, if I can show you, we have extended, in fact, our calculations to 3D. I don't know, I have some results. So this is the results in 3D where I have to put the short range. If not, it collapses. Mm -hmm. And in the, in the 3D, this is how our evolution evolves. This is similar to what uh, Lorian has shown in the, in the Innsbruck experiments, no? Changing the scattering led, the system, evolved from a, from a gas, there's just one drop. It appears to drops. They seems that they, they communicate and finally they are isolated. So, and what's nice in our case is that we can calculate both the static structure factor and the one body density matrix. So if we will have peaks, for instance, this case, or this case is more clear. I have one peak here, which is corresponding to the formation of two drops. And I see a plateau in the one body. It means that the system is super solid. Okay, but in that case, you are right. I need to put the short range part; otherwise, it collapses. Thank you. Maybe I can just make one ah, question in yes. between. Um, so no, you find the super solid only at high density. Huh? At high density, yes. Yeah, and if you would like to compare to experiment, instead you would like to go to a regime where the dipolar and the contact compete roughly on the yeah. same order and go to low density. Yeah. yeah uh, do you expect something uh, uh, Yes. So in the diagram, in the phase diagram, what we see is that we put, if we put the two body part, the, the, the transition moves to the left. So we can, you, you can get stripes at much lower density. Okay. Let me, I don't know if I explaining correctly. Uh, uh, sorry, yeah. here. So what we see is that this line, this phase line moves to the left, okay? Mm -hmm. So in this sense, we were more accessible to the density, but still- That you would have to go uh, to 0 0.01. Yeah, we need, we, no, uh, for the moment, it seems difficult to get this. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So it seems like a superconductor would be different in the sense that there's no shades of superconductivity. It's either a superconductor or it's not. And so if you're looking in quantum Monte Carlo, can you calculate, can you see when something becomes a superconductor? Well, uh, for me, superconducting means superfluidity with charges, okay? So we need to put a charge system, for instance, electrons, uh, but electrons are Coulomb particles, and uh, that's a bit more tricky. Uh, I am not sure. Yeah. So, so just from an experimental uh, impression, 
is there is it are this is there a superconduct is it is the direction across or along the stripes more favored for superconductivity uh along the stripe is clearly favorable because along the stripes okay, okay you have a gas if you want it would be a gas of electrons okay mm -hmm. the question is what happens in the transfer direction exactly that's the thing is the interesting study so because the communication between the stripes as it happens also in the drops is very tiny so i don't know if it would resist uh because uh, rapidly the system becomes to be uh, isolated so insulating yeah <laughs> sorry for yeah. the bad news but uh, just one question what is the tilt angle for the stripes to appear uh the stripe here is the alpha so you can uh, see the phase diagram here of the stripes you can identify between 0.5 and 0.6 and the range of density that you so have here. So if the dipoles are polarized perpendicular to the plane, there are no, there are no stripes, not at all. And horizontal, it, there'll be stripes, no? To, to have stripes, you need anisotropy, okay? The... So it's fundamental. If not, if you don't have anisotropy, the system is poorly uh, repulsive. One over R to the three is just a gas that becomes a crystal at high density, and that's all. So the anisotropy is crucial to get the the drops in the 3D and the stripes in 2D. For me, it's very similar. The stripes and the drops are of the same origin. What determines the direction of stripe? What determines the direction of stripe? Uh, uh, well, you are in a plane, so uh, it's XY plane, but yeah. So essentially, you have two directions, and then are the generate. No, so this one and this one. In this case is where it is more attractive and this is more repulsive. So the system organizes in a stripes following the more attractive part, which in our case is the y, the, the y axis. Yeah. Thank you very much. I have a final question regarding the, the bilayer case. Yeah. So imagine a situation in each one of the layers isolated tends to form a crystal, for example, with uh -huh. a certain periodicity. And then uh, you, you choose the periodicity uh, period, the period of, of this crystallization to be irrational between the two ones. So if you couple them together, then yeah, there's a competition between two crystallization uh, periods that is irrational. So in principle, it could go towards a quasi-crystal or something like that. Mm -hmm. Is it possible? Uh, in the imagination, yes. But uh, the problem is that in, in a single layer, it's hard to have a crystal. They need to go to very high density. If I have to take a layer, I need to go to a density extremely more than 200 in these units to crystallize, which is a regime in which uh, obviously we are very far from what is interesting. Theoretically, we can go to, <laughs> but yeah, sometimes our our ideas from theory are not uh, appro approaching the, the ones from experiments. So we live in another world sometimes, no? So theoreticians work in, a, I don't know. We search for beautiful things, but then uh, it happens that are not doable. In that case of the bilayer, multilayer, it seems that now could be possible we, in bilayer, but probably they can make a, a, more than a bilayer, I think. I think so. Yes. Hi, in the case of the helium on the graphite, yes. in the second layer, how do you know that is a solid and not a liquid that is Yeah, there? well, good question. In that case, what we make to decide the phases is to repeat calculations using a translational invariant wave function. Okay, you use a Jastro normal without localizations. And then you calculate also with one with putting the particles in the points where the crystal will form. And then you, you compare the energies. So you calculate with two symmetries and you decide which symmetry is the best according to the minimum energy. Because you are at zero temperature, there is no entropy here. Okay, okay I see no urgent question. And for sake of time, I think it's a good time to make a break. And we start in also 20 minutes or so. Yeah, thanks Thank again. You. So at three.
I don't know. Can we try? Hello. Is it not this? I don't know. Hello. I think. Did you move this? No, I did not do anything. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. It's okay. Now it is on. Okay, good. I propose that we start again. So the last talk for today is from Sadan Adikari on uh, super solid formation in a bosal chain condensate. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I thank the organizers for inviting me and organizing such a, such a beautiful conference where so many speakers talked about many different topics of cold atom physics and especially super solid. There are several talks before mine on super solids. So I'll talk from a different point of view. There are talks on experiments and exact Monte Carlo type calculations, but I'll talk from a different approach, mean field calculations of the same thing around mean, about mean field calculations. I am from the Institute of Theoretical Physics of the University, State University of Sao Paulo. And this is a symbol and it's a funding from CNPQ. And physically our institute was located in this place till about 2009. And then we moved out of this place. This, this place belonged to the Foundation of Institute of Theoretical Physics, and they administered this place, and we moved out in a different campus. So this place, I am familiar with this place. And my, I'll talk about my collaborators on these things. Uh, this is Luis Yang Silva. He's from University of Cartagena, Cartagena Colombia. And two collaborators from India. This is Sandeep Gautam. He's a long time collaborator on dipolar BEC with me and a PhD student who works with Sandeep Gautam. Uh, that is not going. Oh, now it. Now, Super, you have seen that what is super solid? Super solid has the properties of both superfluid and crystalline solid. Superfluid, it flows without, free, without friction. That's a simple property. It has a phase coherence. And if it is a crystalline solid, it does not have continuum translation and symmetry, it is broken. It has discrete translation and symmetry, and you have at the same time uh, breaking up uh, gauge symmetry, continuum gauge symmetry, because of the generation of the phase coherence. And this was observed experimentally, a superfluid in two cases. So a crystalline structure, and the, most of the experiments, they tried to also verify if there is superfluidity and if the crystalline structure is rigid, if that is not, that doesn't easily break. It was observed in dipolar Bose Einstein condensate and also spin orbit coupled SOC spin half BEC. So, in tra trapped dipolar Bose Einstein condensate, it is possible to have square triangular and honeycomb, honeycomb lattice and other symmetries also. But experimentally, the preliminary pictures, they showed mostly the triangular or hexagonal symmetry. And trapped and uniform spin half, spin one, sp and spin two, and even spin three systems, they showed, show different types of symmetries. So, Apart from mean field calculation, you can do theoretical calculations, sometimes using uh, variational approach, and sometimes 
using the solution of the uh, so problem with no nonlinearity, so solution of the homogeneous problem. And that, from those solutions, you can construct these symmetries. And we'll talk about future experimental possibilities. A super solid is a quantum object which is periodic and an ordered, spatially ordered, stable structure as a solid crystal that, that can flow without a without friction. This concept was suggested by many authors. It has been shown by previous speakers, but it gained more impact, more attention after the work of Andre and Lipschitz, who, uh, who and after that, many years passed and re only recently we have seen the experimentally some signs of super, super solidity. Super solid. And what is the idea of Andre and Lipschitz? It's a, usually the super solid is, is a, you have to create a, a modulation in, in the density like you have to arrange certain amount of particles or entity in one place and another place. Usually the ground state of any system is uniform. The ground state of the uh, harmonic oscillator problem, this, this has no structure. First excited state, you have some structure and you have to go higher and higher in the excited states to create structure in the density. And at, so you need some density to create this, some energy to create this. So at some critical wavelength, you see the, as the wavelength of the modulation decreases, the, you have less, less and less things, the energy is less. And if the wavelength of modulation decreases, you need excite, make excited, you need more energy. So some energy is needed. So Andre and Lipschitz, they argued that if, it, if the temperature was cold enough, this energy could, in some system could be typically zero. And then the system will form, spontaneously form a periodic modulation in density at this wavelength. So that is the idea. So, there is a small difference between super solid and crystal in mean field approach. A crystal is a spatial periodic arrangement of atoms, but super solid is a, which we will observe, a spatially periodic phase coherent arrangement of small droplets, each containing many thousands of atoms, maybe molecules. Because of phase coherence, a super solid is expected to be able to move without deformation. This, it, something like could sh should be able to move. But if it is in a trapped system, there are other ways to check this movement in case of mean field calculation. And 2004, some group, Kim and Chen, they tried to, they uh, published a paper where they reported super solidity of helium, helium-4, but which could not be repeated, maybe because of some experimental error or other thing. And some groups are working in this direction, but the possibility of finding a super solid helium-4 seems remote, but it's not excluded. It's possible that there could be super solidity in liquid helium-4. So these are the two papers. The first paper showed the super solidity and second paper um, contested it. The super solidity and dipolar BEC. In 2019, in different experiments, three groups led by these three groups, uh, Francesca Ferlaino, Modugno, and Tillman Fau, they observed super solidity in a quasi 1D dipolar system. And in 2021, the same group, the Fairline group, observed a quasi 2D dipolar supersolid with hexagonal symmetry. And these are the references of those. 
papers, four papers, and super solidity in a spin orbit coupled BSC. We, I'll talk about what is a spin orbit coupled BSC because in a normal atom, the electrons have charge. So electron associated with the charge as it moves in an orbit, it has angular momentum and it generates a magnetic moment. And that uh, interacts with the magnetic moment which of spin degree of freedom. So it makes the L dot S coupling. But we'll see that this spin orbit coupled BC, that is the, in case of atoms, the atoms does not uh, atoms do not have charge, but when they move, it is possible to create a coupling between the motion and the spin degree of freedom. We'll see how it is done. And in these two experiments, they observed super solidity in spin orbit coupled BEC. So we'll report some of our studies of new results on super solid, this partially periodic super superfluid states in quasi 2D dipolar BEC and quasi 2D spin one and spin two, spin orbit coupled BEC. So spontaneous uh, periodic structure in a dipolar BEC. One can have a spatially periodic structure in the trap quasi 1D and quasi 2D dipolar BEC. Will it, uh, it can be shown in, it was shown in experiment and also it can be shown in theoretical calculations. The experimentally observed was the linear and hexagonal lattice structure, but theoretically we can predict other structures also square, honeycomb lattice in quasi 2D dipolar BEC and also in spin orbit coupled BEC and rectangular orb orbit, orbit lattice, these are also possible in dipolar BEC. Now let us talk about a little bit about the dipolar BEC. It's a very simple thing. So dipole moment of these, these are the atoms which are normally used in experiments, dipolar experiments. And they have a large dipolar moment compared to the rubidium atom or other atoms, alkali metal atoms, which has one unit of magne uh, Bohr magneton, this dipole moment. For some reason, the nature is not so symmetric. So these other net atoms have many unpaired electrons. And so they have large dipole moment. And dipole moment is a measure of this dipole moment is the dipole length, which is, easy, which is used in most of the calculations. You have seen this, this is the measure of the interaction strength, dipolar interaction strength. So you can have this dipolar interaction, it's angle dependent interaction. You can have an arbitrary reaction to dipoles. It's like tiny magnets. You can have them this way or this way or this way. So this is called, if this is oriented in a plane, in a line, it, is, it will form a figure shaped. It is attraction between the north and south poles of the magnet because each atom acts like a tiny magnet. And if it is this shaped, it st stays like this and there'll be repulsion. In this case, there'll be repulsion between the different atoms, the dipolar interaction. And this is the static dipole-dipole interaction. There are two kinds of two possibilities. One is the magnetic dipole-dipole interaction between these atoms. Also, you can have between molecules the electrostatic dipole-dipole interaction, the electric and magnetic. So the important thing is that if the two dipoles are oriented like this, it is stable and attractive, favorable, and this is unfavorable. And this is the interaction potential. You see, if you have a dipolar BEC, and if you increase the dipolar moment, relative dipolar moment by 
controlling the contact interaction. There is always a repulsive contact interaction. If you reduce that, the dipole interaction increases, and then the condensate becomes elongated in the direction of dipole moment. So atomic dipolar B is a sh short range contact interaction controlled by atomic scattering length and long range dipolar interaction contact controlled by ADD. The ratio between the two gives this, and this determines many property, the epsilon DD of this the system. So one interesting thing is the matter in bulk is stable because of short range repulsion and, uh, in nuclear, atomic, molecular physics, and long range attraction, which makes the thing stable, matter stable. So dipolar interaction usually makes a stable dipolar system. But the trouble is that the dipolar interaction is not attractive in all directions. And because of this, the mean field theory leads to collapse instability, collapse for any trap and for any number of atoms for a sufficiently strong dipolar interaction. So dipolar droplet, this was seen first in this experiment in 2016. In this classical experiment, they observed that there is spontaneous transition from an unstructured superfluid to an ordered arrangement of droplets in a quasi 2D dipolar BEC in the collapse region where there is co would be expected collapse. What is the collapse region? If you solve the gross pitaevsky equation, because here people showed this equation, and this is for dysprosthium, and this is the scattering length, which can be varied by feedback resonance, and this is the experimental value of scattering length. And this is the EDD, that parameter I showed. The region below this green line is this collapse region. So, the, in the, but this way, this is the number of atoms and this is the, this is the scattering length. But it ha in that experiment, it was seen that in this region, you have droplet formation. But usually the Gross-Pitaevsky equation will show collapse in this region. So this is the mean field collapse region. So later on, this experiment was repeated. Now this is, the, no, sorry, sorry. This is the result of the, that experiment. This, the experiment showed this kind of droplets in that. But at that time, and they showed something, uh, uh, generation of something like 10 droplets, they're a trend. But in this, in this problem, in this, in this paper, they did not care about super solidity. They are more surprised because of the, this, this drew a lot of attention because the system did not collapse but form droplets. And these droplets typically had some 10,000 atoms, something like that. So dipolar B is stabilized by beyond mill field correction because gross pitaevsky equation is true in the very weak coupling limit when the gas parameter a times scattering length times density to the power one third is very small. But if, if it is large, then other quant higher order quantum corrections are important. And the one of these lowest quantum correction was calculated by Li Huang Yang long time back in 1960s. And this is repulsive, strongly repulsive, so it can at short distance and it can stop the collapse. So that, that's why the collapse is stopped, but if the number of atoms go beyond certain size in that trap, it again collapses, but the stable position is formation of two droplets, two dro droplets and not a very large droplet. So that's why they break and try to form arrange on a lattice. In all, all problems, all studies here, 
the dipole moment is perpendicular to the plane of the lattice, always. So in the plane of the lattice, where the lattice is formed, this one, this plane, the these droplets are repulsive. So they stay apart and the trap keeps them together. So the, this is the 1D trap. The, if the form, uh, trap is 1D, three experiments, they showed that there is formation of droplets along a line. And four or five droplets are seen at that, that time. And this is the result of one of the experiments. This paper, 2019, three papers were published in 2019. So if they, if you expand and this, you, if you plot the linear density, it is like this, three droplets, three droplets. And once it is largely separate, you can really see the, after expansion, three droplets separated. And this is the result of the 2D trap work in 2021. So you can have three droplets in, in a line to seven, the hexagonal lattice in a 2D shaped, 2D shaped uh, trap. So this is the gross witajewski equation that we'll be using for the calculation. The first line is known to everybody the simple equation and the second line this puts the dipolar interaction that interaction here udd is the dipolar interaction and this is the correction higher order correction due to li huang yang and for the stationary state you have this hamiltonian equal to mu times psi and this is a trap and this is the dipole length of the system so what, what is the modified Li Huang Yang interaction due to Lima, Professor Lima, uh, Professor Pelster and Lima? This is the original coefficient that was given attributed to this other uh, this term gamma L H Y. And the correction for dipolar thing is this. Uh, this is this. And this integral, this is this goes to one when the dipole epsilon dd is zero, no dipole moment. And this is the integral. This integral can be worked out this way, and e is this. So we'll be using this for our for our calculation, this model. Once we make this model, this is the model, it becomes different from experiment and reality. So whatever you will see after this is the result of this model calculation. And this is the energy of that system. This is the energy of that system for that model. So I will be talking about the 2D trap mostly, a numerical simulation with Dispersion of atoms, ADD is this, and A experimentally is this. A smaller A facilitates the formation of droplets. You have seen that the collapse region in that figure is here down below, and experiment marginally uh, touches the collapse region, this experiment. So it will be better to keep it here where it goes well into the collapse region. So you can use the phase back resonance to take the scattering length at 85. In some other values, this study was 88 was used. And results of calculation, the three dim will solve three-dimensional Rospitaevsky equation. It's solved by Frank Nicholson method, and they, they, we published these programs for solving to be used in this solution. And the harmonic traps, we'll be using three harmonic traps. 
omega x will be taken always 33 and 167 hertz and we'll be using a quasi 1d trap with omega y 110 and the mixed trap medium which is omega y equals 60 hertz and the third trap is quasi 2d it's 33 but in the experiment uh, the omega x and omega y are not identical, but we'll, we'll take them identical. So you see that if you pro multiply wx, wy, wz, this trap is strong, strongest. This is mixed, this is medium, but it is between 1D and 2D, and this is 2D, and this is the weakest trap. Let us see some results. We have 25,000 atoms, and A, this is the 1D trap. 1D is the top, uh, this top, top trap. This is the strongest trap. So we have three droplets. Then this is the mixed tra trap, which is weaker, the second trap, which is medium. It's not so strong. So you see only one droplet is formed because the first trap is very strong. So this is crushed in the middle and three droplets are formed. Now it is one droplet from. And then you go to the 2D trap. And 2D trap, no droplet is formed because it's at this stage weak enough for the system to make collapse and form droplets. But if you take more atoms, it forms a droplet. Now we increase the number of atoms. This you see, this is twenty-five thousand atoms, twenty-five thousand, twenty-five thousand, and this is forty thousand. If you increase the number of atoms, seventy thousand, you have more droplets, because the stable situation will be forming more droplets, and they separate due to repulsion in that plane, because the uh, dipole moment is always perpendicular to this plane. And now you, you take a weaker droplet. We weaker. This is the mixed. This is the mixed um, trap, which is neither strongly 1D nor strongly 2D. So some droplets go in the other direction. And this is the 3D trap, uh, 2D trap. So it is more symmetric. And if you increase the number of atoms in the 2D trap, it makes more droplets. Finally, we have more, increase the number of atoms further, you have more droplets. And if you come to the middle droplet, some droplets go outside. And this is the 2D plane, so it's more symmetric. And this is still 2D plane. But you'll see one thing. Here we showed uh, a square lattice symmetry. Here is a triangular lattice symmetry. This is, we, we are presenting this result, but here also we can have the triangular lattice symmetry and here also the square lattice symmetry. You will see that. So first we show the results of square lattice symmetry. This is, this is number of atoms. And this is always now, quasi 2D trap, the weakest trap, which is the X and Y plane. The frequency of trapping is 33, and in the Z direction is 167. So these are the symmetric, parity symmetric states. You have a maximum in the center. So three by three, five by five, and seven by seven. And now this is parity anti-symmetric state when there's zero at the center, two by two, four by four, and six by six. But see, in the, in the same trap, you can have the hexagonal lattice, or you can have honeycomb lattice, something like this. Energies are quite similar. But how it's three-dimensional isosurface of these things. This is the square lattice. 
this is honeycomb lattice and this is hexagonal lattice. So now it's x, y, and z is the perpendicular plane. Previously, we are observing a section of this in the x, y plane. But what is the universality in there? But now I, I, I make some comments. But how, how could I make, generate all the three different types of lattice? Sometimes I give a, in, as the initial state, a uniform, uh, a ball, ball means spher spheric, spherically or circularly symmetric state and it breaks during it, uh, numerical iteration and it forms droplets and that somehow goes to one of the final solutions. But we, I can also give an initial state which is like this or which has a hexagonal structure. I give one state with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven initials this one and increase the number of atoms then it forms more droplets outside and stays in the hexagonal thing and similarly if i give a as the initial state some state of square lattice symmetry it goes to the square lattice state usually so sometimes it goes to a non-periodic state also there is a question is it always periodic no it is not always periodic it but sometimes it goes to a non-periodic state, many droplets. So, but interesting thing, the universality of this is the energy. So, there's the fitting, straight line fitting here. And green is this square, this is square lattice states, triangular lattice states, honeycomb lattice states. And these are mixed, which are nothing, neither this neither that and at this is the for that trap the droplets are formed around 33000 atoms and this is the region where there are no droplets so this is ordinary bc that follows that that thing and these are the energy of droplet these few uh, circles are taken from another paper, 39, a paper by uh, Blackie from New Zealand. He had a very strong trap and strong, strong um, attraction. So the droplets are formed at small, small values of no, uh, uh, num atom number on each droplet containing small number of atoms. Compared to this, this is the number of atoms, this is energy, n is the number of atoms. But what, what is interesting that it follows the same line. And this is the number of droplet which increases with the number of atoms. So this scaling is like this. It is different from Thomas Fermi scaling, Thomas Fermi energy. This goes to this has a scaling and number of droplet was like this. And this includes all types of symmetries. But trouble with the harmonic trap. The harmonic trap makes the formation of large supersolid lattice very difficult and generates intense background atom cloud many times. So you will see that. There's a red cloud here around these things. And this can be reduced by taking a, in case of a box trap. So I give some result of the box trap. The droplets are, there is no, there is a box trap at the boundary and I form these droplets. But will you ask, did I put this thing as initial state? No. I put this such a thing as initial state, but it rearranged in this fashion. And these states are probably for that separation of box trap. The, the say we took the, take the wave function zero at the boundary of the box. The box size is given in each case. So it is very 
very robust because it, it changed from this this setting to this i never thought about this setting uh, now the experimental possibilities i had some comment in 1d experiment only few droplets maybe always less than around eight ten droplets in one or two d setting was found huge lattice is possible in theoretical model with Rossby type c and li huang yang correction valid in, but this correction this thing this hamiltonian is valid only in the weak coupling limit of this a is the scattering length this is the density to the power one third less than one so experiment will be guided by the quantum mechanics and not by the theoretical model. So collapse droplets have high density and we are moving away from the weak coupling limit. So higher order terms should be important and we have to correctly sum a slowly convergent or even divergent series of corrections. So careful experiments are called for to see if a large super solid can be formed in this model. But I believe that the Li Huang correction, which is valid in the weak coupling limit, and we are using it in a relatively stronger coupling limit, and it, it, is, it is generating too much repulsion in the theoretical model. And because of that large repulsion, the system cannot collapse and we form a big droplet lattice and that repulsion should be somehow attenuated some, somehow reduced and in that case so many droplets will not be formed so this we publish these papers on this So let us talk about a little bit a uh, different problem, spontaneous periodic structure and spin orbit coupled SOC BSC. One can have a sp 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 spatial periodic structure in component and total density of a spin orbit coupled BEC, both trapped and untrapped. Two to spin half, hyperspin one, hyperspin two, hyperspin three, spin or BECs have been used. So experimentally mentally observed, this stripe has been found in two to spin half spin orbit coupled BEC. A theoretically predicted a stripe structure, square, st square lattice structure, and tri triangular lattice structure in spin one and spin two BEC. There are some paper by other group in spin three BEC where they found some other exotic structure. So what is spin angular momentum in an atom? This is sigma dot L, the spin dot L, L is R cross P. This coupling between spin and momentum naturally arises due to the charge of the electron. So you have two magnetic moments, they, have, they interact. But atoms in a BEC, atom in a BEC does not have charge and this coupling is not possible. Instead, a different coupling between the spin and momentum is engineered in a BEC, will be introduced in a BEC. So we see that a Zeeman interaction is typically represented by mu dot B, and mu is sigma is a spin proportional to spin dot B. So now you'd have a static electric field, and to have put the atom in a static electric field, simplest model. In the lab frame, it generates a magnetic field B in the frame of the moving atom with momentum K. This is just giving a Lorentz transformation to the F mu nu operator that will, will show the, you can, a, he will, F mu nu tensor, it will mix the electric and magnetic field. And if you take a pure uh, electric field, this will generate a magnetic field. And once it generates a magnetic field, this is an external electric field. Once it generates a magnetic field, this term will generate this kind of interaction. So it generates a coupling between spin and motion of the atom. And this coupling is known as, exactly this form of coupling is known as the Rasba spin orbit coupling. But this is not spin orbital angular momentum coupling, but this is a coupling between spin and momentum. It's different from S dot L coupling. 
it has spin or interaction, a spin orbit coupled BEC has spin or interaction and spin orbit coupling interaction. Spin orbit coupling interaction is this. For simplicity, we'll consider this spin orbit couple SOC, the spin orbit coupling interaction and no spinner interaction. So we'll have a BEC of different components with no spinner interaction. The spinner interaction can be removed by adjusting the different scattering length in, because now there are three components or five components of BEC. So in three components, you will have the uh, different scattering lengths in spin zero, spin one, spin two, this kind of things. Whereas in a scalar BEC, you have one scattering length. You have many scattering lengths here. And somehow if you tune by phase back resonance, the scattering lengths to be equal, you can eliminate the spinner interaction. We did the calculation with spinner interaction and without spinner in interaction. So here I am presenting results of the without spinner interaction because that's simple. So the, you have seen the, those are the sigma, the sigma x, sigma y, sigma z, this is sigma x and sigma y. For this is spin one, this is spin two. So the equations, the gross p type key equations, it will have, it has this form. So there are three components now. Spin one, hyper point state, this spin plus one component, spin minus one component, spin zero component. And these are the spin orbit coupled terms, which come from the Rajba spin orbit coupling. The spin, the spin matrix coupled to the momentum. And these, these are the derivatives of the space. D plus minus dx, this, dy, dx is this, dy is this, dt is this. And here the nonlinearity is the total nonlinearity of the three components. So we don't have, we have only one scattering length, a zero, the spin, spin zero, and the other scattering length is made equal to this by uh, a phase back resonance, we assume, and then the spinner interaction goes away. N is the total density, like this, and it has three components. And C0 is the nonlinearity, this nonlinearity. And spin two is technically more complicated, but it's a similar set of equations. Spin two BEC. Uh, now we'll show some results. And again, you can calculate the energy. But it's again, as in a gross p type equation, but it's a technical thing. The two dimensional, we'll solve the two dimensional spin orbit coupled GP equation and numerically again by this. And these are the programs which are published in these papers. Super solid formation is possible in both trapped and untrapped systems. Well, I, about the theoretical th part, theoretical foundation, we did the, in the, I forgot to tell, did not bring, the super solid dipolar system. We can do the variational calculation by putting the, for small system, putting the droplets in arrays and minimize the energy. And here we can do a theoretical calculation by solving the linear problem. This problem is just putting the nonlinearity to zero. And they show the same structure. And now spin one and speed two, we are talking about uh, soliton free system. So you have to have the nonlinearity negative nonlinearity large so that a soliton or bound state is formed. And this is the collapse region, like a scalar BEC. And this gamma is the strength of the 
uh, spin orbit coupling interaction. So there are some results, the strength of the spin orbit coupling interaction. And the C0 was fixed. It's not changed from figure to figure. C0 is fixed to something like minus 0.5. So these are the results which are, which show ha has some vortex and so on. This radially periodic. These are these are not really super solid states, but this comes out from the solution of the linear equation, also. And these are the states. This is a asymmetric state, and these are the stripe states that come for gamma equal to four in spin one system, and C0 is minus 0 0.6. And these are the, you see the two dimensional square lattice. These are the two components. Here there is no asymmetry, and the plus spin half, uh, plus one spin component and minus one spin component, they are same density, and this is the spin zero component. And this is the total density of the three components. You see, there is a structure, square lattice structure present. And if you go to a higher spin, uh, gamma equal to eight, this square lattice, uh, this stripe structure survives in the total density. Same result, similar result for spin two. You have a vortex at the center, symmetric case plus two minus two for plus minus, and this is plus minus one, and there is no vortex and total density, there is no, no, no structure. So there is only radially periodic structure. But you, for gamma equal to one, you have you can have a triangular lattice, this is spin two system. And C zero is, I think minus one, this is spin two system, you have this triangular lattice structure, which was absent in, spin one and also through spin half. But also you can have square lattice structure like this and stripes. Again, the, there is no stripe here in the total density, but the stripe will appear in the total density as gamma is increased. I didn't show the result. And here is some plot of energy. of different types of states, square, square lattice, these vortex states, asymmetric states, stripe states, this is the energy. And these results are published in these papers. Here they, we have the full spinner interaction for spin one. We have full spinner interaction for spin two. Here, so this has, uh, ferromagnetic, paramagnetic states, and here you have ferromagnetic, paramagnetic, magnetic, and cyclic states. Higher up you go in spin, like spin three, they have other magnetic states. And this is without magnetism, making all with no spin or interaction. So different spatial periodic structures are possible in different BEC. Apart from new experiments and theoretical studies to find these stationary structures, one could consider studies in dynamics to test the superfluidity and rigidity. All the present stage of experiment in SOC BEC seems to be difficult. Theoretical studies of this may reveal the uh, super solidity in general. The experiment on SOC BEC that was that showed super solidity that was in a quasi 1D trap. And this is, these are 2D, which is, a, which is more complicated technically. So thank you for the attention. Thank you very much. So we have some time for questions. Like, uh, do you have any indication if these structures are super solid or just solids? Which one? The, all these structures of, of the droplets? All, all these are, should be super solid, solids because they are phase coherent. 
But, but how you show the phase coherence? Because it's solved by the mean, mean field equation. Ah, I think it's not enough. No? And But we also studied dynamics. Dynamics one is oscillation. It does not change shape and also angular oscillation. Mm, it's a bit that is the experimental dynamic. test. Yeah. For no, yes. For me, it's not fully convincing. Thing. Of course no, not. But you it... need to add some noise. But I think at this scattering length, from the structure that you show, I would not say yeah. that it's super solid. They say it again. At, uh, you would need to add some noise into your simulation, no? To yes, yes, to yes, see. yes, yes. Did noise, but it is, it's oscillation, angular oscillation. Yes. We did. For one dimensional, it's perfect. It oscillates. And mm -hmm. scissor mode oscillation. Scissor mode oscillation yeah. is that you have an asymmetric trap in the XY plane. Mm -hmm. So if you give a rotation, it starts oscillating. Yeah, I don't know. I would say also from the density. Like no, the, it is always there. The noise is always there. It's full of noise. A real time simulation we have done, mm -hmm. and it's full of noise. Mm -hmm. okay. Like I... an experiment, you have a lot of noise, and this is this in numerical real time simulation. Also, there is noise. They are stable. Mm -hmm. Can I ask also one question on yes. this um, um, flat, like the, the flat uh, traps, like uniform traps? Uniform traps, yes. Yeah. So what, um, what are the boundary conditions that you used? Uh, this uniform trap uh, is no, the, the periodic boundary condition. Periodic boundary condition. There is no tra no end. Okay. There's no end. This is not a real soliton because it cannot move because of the spin orbit coupling. Mm -hmm. But its stationary state, it extends to a long distance. And there's no, no, no end of the calculation. So periodic boundary condition, yeah. I guess. No, I mean, I meant actually for the dipolar case, but I guess it's the same. Dipolar is not soliton. No, no, I mean the flat. You had uh, uniform traps. Oh. And dipolar, there is trap. Yeah, but after you presented something with a, like, with a uniform trap, with a box trap. Oh, uniform box trap. Yes. Box trap is the boundary, it is zero. Boundary is zero. The condition for the box trap. And there is no effect of this box shape? No, no, no. Uh, the box trap, the, on the boundary of the box, the wave function is zero. It's forced to be zero. And if you don't take a square, but a, a circular trap, or this trap oh, that this the cal uh, Yes, I tried, but uh, it becomes messy. Okay. Calculation becomes a little bit messy with the hexagonal mm -hmm. trap. You have to define it. But it's, you should take it, and it is always possible. Triangular trap. So the wave function is forced to be zero on the boundary. Mm -hmm. There are some other questions. But there are experiments being done with box trap. Many experiments are being done with the box trap. With dipoles? Hmm? With dipoles? No, no. Only box trap is available in the market. <laughs> yeah, yeah. People are doing experiment. Now, not with dipolar system or with spin orbit coupled system. Yeah. Yeah. No, you can also have a triangular one. So if you, if you have a rectangular box, then that means traps in the X and Y plane are different, the two frequencies. Then the square lattice will become a rectangular lattice. If the trap, harmonic trap in the X and Y direction are different. Huh? Yeah. 
Hmm. More stab stable in the triangular lattice. Is possible. Now, this is stability, but if you shake it, move it, one could be more stable than the other, probably. That's what you are saying, no? It's, yes, possible, yeah. But the difference in energy is very, very small. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. But okay, I don't see any more questions. But uh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. So, um, do you generate these configurations by a sudden quench? By theoretically. Do you quench something, temperature or? No, no, there's no temperature. What do you What do you quench to create this? This this thing. Yeah. How do you? How oh, do you that, how do you do? The simplest way is this. Uh, this figure. You see, you give even you can give this as initial state, and do the calculation. It becomes uh, sorry. I don't know. Uh, yes, it, yes, yes. Imaginary. It becomes that imaginary time. You give this as the initial state. It becomes this as the final state in the calculation. But I don't have control. It can go to another state depending on the trap. But like between this and this, this is more number of atoms. But for same number of atoms, it can go to two different structures from the initial state. So it, you need a guidance you have to select. I'm showing those states which are really symmetric. It has some sim spatial symmetry, but that could be ugly states also. Okay, any more questions? If that's not the case, that's fine to repeat speaker again. Okay. And we have the poster session now.